Good afternoon, everybody. This is Sophie O'Keefe. I'm the Professional Development Manager at English Australia. Thank you for attending our webinar this afternoon. I'd like to introduce our two presenters. Firstly, we have Paula Dimmel, who's the Education Program Manager at the University of Adelaide's English Language Centre. And with her presenting is her colleague, Sandra Kayon Parsons, who's the Education Advisor at the University of Adelaide's English Language Centre. So thank you for coming to present for us today, ladies. Um, Sandra and Paula recently presented on gratitude at the English Australia Conference, and they'll be including part of that presentation in today's webinar towards the end. So thank you, ladies. Hello, everyone. I'm Sandra. Hi, I'm Paula from the University of Adelaide's English Language Centre. And thanks for taking some time out of your day for this webinar. Um, Paula and I have been focusing on student wellbeing recently and we presented at the September EA conference and some of the things that we're doing at our centre. Um, Sophie, we're all of a sudden it's not moving to the next slide so I'm not sure what's happening. There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, so today we're going to look through, um, we're going to go over a, a few different things. Our overview uh, is well-being and learning. That's what we're going to start with. Um, then we'll move on to stress. Well, it's not really versus anxiety, but looking at the differences between the two. Uh, some common signs and symptoms of anxiety and how it presents. Then we're going to just move to a mental health first aid, a plan, an action plan that we um, go towards. The ALGI is the acronym. And within that, follow on with some of the things that you can say, some expressions and language that can be used as staff members and what you should do. And we're going to finish off with some strategies and activities that we have, um, that we're using here at our centre to promote wellbeing. Okay, so wellbeing is a well-known and well-researched contributing factor to success. There's no denying that. And wellbeing and learning cannot be separated, one supports the other. So it underpins the way students feel about themselves and how they relate to others. So wellbeing also affects how students think, how they learn and how they engage with everyone around them. So the development of students' wellbeing, including their health, um, coping strategies and engagement all play a significant role in the achievement of learning outcomes and graduate employability. So students who are stressed and experience anxiety have a lot more difficulty in concentrating. Um, they have reduced attention, uh, memory is affected, uh, learning and um, is affected and some of the these are some of the first signs of um, stress and anxiety. So strategies that decrease negative emotions and increase positive emotions will facilitate better learning. Plus you have a more engaged class and this makes for a better teaching and learning experience for both the teachers and students. The 2018 English Australia Guide to Best Practice in International Student Mental Health pointed out that anxiety, depression and extreme worry due to financial stress and study were the three top mental health issues identified by the Alicos sector. And recent media has even reinforced that the weight of cultural expectations, both academic and financial, are huge and, and often can lead to a sense of failure as well as cultural implications surrounding seeking help. International students are more likely to leave help seeking until they're really, really unwell. That's what we've found. Um, so our students may come from a culture where perhaps mental illness is stigmatised or not even recognised. Um, so this makes seeking help near impossible to these students. Symptoms of mental illness such as, um, well, they can present like as headaches, insomnia, or gastrointestinal issues. And so often students in, you know, interpret these as physiological 
rather than psychological. Also connected to this, often our students, you know, who are facing these high levels of stress may tend to think that they aren't working hard enough. They blame themselves and said, oh, I'm not working hard enough, rather than actually looking for ways to manage the stress. So before we look at some of the strategies that can decrease negative emotions and increase positive emotions, we need to have an understanding of what the triggers are and what some of the symptoms look like. There we go. So all students, regardless of where they're from, whether they're local students, whether they're international students, can have a high degree of stress and anxiety. Traditional pressures related to study might include academic performance, study, work, life balance, social pressures, etc. So just take a moment and make a note of some of the times that your students feel stressed and what are some of the challenges that they face? What are these stress triggers for your students? You may have thought about some of these things. Um, often our students have to cope on their own. For many students, it's the first time that they're truly living on their own. They've left the safe environment of their family home and they no longer have a community or a family to look out for them. They're expected to take care of themselves as best they can, figuring out tasks like washing their clothes, cleaning their room, cooking for themselves, sometimes even a simple task like finding a supermarket. While most students are up to this task, it's still a significant life-changing event with an initial shock that can generate stress for many people. There's also the distance from loved ones and support networks to consider. Up until this point, most of our students will have never spent this much time away from their parents, relatives, friends and community. Now, all of a sudden, they find themselves in this new environment they have to deal with a totally different culture, surrounded by new people, with people they care about maybe hundreds of miles away. Academic performance is also a factor related to stress. I'm sure this is one that you might have thought of, and this can also be related to family pressure and the requirements for international student visas. This study period can also be very expensive for our students, and students might have trouble making ends meet in terms of food, accommodation, tuition fees, books, etc. Everything adds up. So money is understandably a huge source of stress. A demanding schedule and lack of free time is also often a trigger. Everyone needs time to unwind and taking some downtime is often the best way to get rid of stress. However, sometimes university life doesn't allow for this, particularly for those students who are struggling to keep up. So what's the difference between stress and anxiety? There is a distinction between the two. Um, stress is simply what we feel as the result of how the human body reacts to certain internal or external demands. Each student or every person will respond differently, even if the demands they face are identical. Stress can be more manageable or finite. You know, that is, it can end when the stressful moment has passed. Um, but it can also lead to an anxiety. If chronic stress is ignored for long enough, it can eventually lead to mental and physical breakdowns and even depression. Anxiety is more than just feeling stressed or worried, and it continues on even if the trigger has passed. Um, anxiety can have such a detrimental effect on even little things in a person's daily life, from getting out of bed, getting ready to go to school, to making decisions about what to eat. We all might get these feelings um, and be able to snap out of it. However, for a person experiencing anxiety, it becomes uncontrollable. They can't control it. <coughs> Anxiety is common. Um, there are some statistics down the bottom. One in three women and one in five men um, will experience an anxiety condition at some stage of this life. Is this surprising for you? Um, 
you know, remembering for our students, studying abroad can be one of the most stressful periods in their life. So we need to remember that, you know, stress can develop into anxiety as time goes on. And the most effective interventions are those that begin early. So later in our webinar, uh, we'll talk more about some preventative strategies, some proactive preventative strategies um, that we can embed into our classrooms. So what does anxiety look like? Everyone's different and it's often a combination of factors that can contribute to a person developing anxiety as we've looked at before. Um, the most important thing is to recognise the signs and symptoms of anxiety and to seek support. The sooner our students seek help, the sooner, sooner they can recover. Many don't realise that treatment can help them have a better life. In fact, in Australia last year, only 38% of people with anxiety sought professional help. And from what we know about our international students, this number may actually be a lot lower for them. So how do I know if someone has anxiety? It can vary in severity from mild uneasiness through to panic attacks. Anxiety can also vary in how long it lasts from just a few seconds um, to years. As we've, as we've stated before, anxiety problems differ from stress in the following ways. They're more severe, longer lasting, and interfere with work, study, or relationships. For our students, the most common symptoms that they might present with are from the, the list on this, this slide we've got here. So if we stop and consider, you know, you know, well, first of all, let's look at a few of them. Um, racing heart, tightening of the chest. And this can often, you know, be, you know, sometimes think people get, oh, I'm having a heart attack, you know, depending on how they're feeling, or it could be a panic attack. Snowballing worries, obsessive thinking and compulsive behaviour. And we've got, got those students who are absent a lot or late a lot. Um, the obvious signs of grades going down and missing deadlines, um, their inability to make decisions, they become really indecisive. They're, they might change, they might become more emotional or aggressive than, than how they are usually. So let's, you know, if we look and consider these, it might manifest itself um, and we may see the implications in their thinking, feeling, behaviour and physical effects, and all of which may contribute to a student finding themselves on a losing streak or disengaged or in a cycle of stress and anxiety, which is hard to get out of. So let's look at some of the signs and symptoms of anxiety more closely and how they present. So this is in how, how it affects how students think. You know, um, some of these we've mentioned already, you know, the mind racing or going blank this decreased concentration and unable to remember, you know, even to where their classroom is from day to day, um, confusion, and, and they find it really hard to stop worrying. And this other side of feeling guilty or inadequate, everyone else seems to be doing really well and they're not doing well. Um, there's this helplessness and this failure. So this is what's going through their mind with their thinking. It can also affect how they feel um, really overwhelmed by what's ahead, what they have to do, or the deadlines they have to keep. Um, they might get really worried about physical symptoms, you know, if they are vomiting or unable to sleep, and as I said, having these headaches, stomach aches, you know, they might have this real fear that there's an undiagnosed medical problem, not realising it's more a psychological problem. Um, dreading that something really bad is going to happen. And constantly on edge really nervous and having this uncontrollable or overwhelming panic. Uh, behaviour, this is the, one of the things that we can see and the thinking and the feeling maybe not so much, um, but we can, uh, by look, observing their behaviour, we might find them withdrawing um, from different um, activities that they usually were quite involved in in the class. Um, obsessive compulsive behaviour, we might pick up things like that or a student may even tell us that they're unable to sleep, they're having real trouble um, and not sleeping and come, when they finally come to class they're exhausted. In social situations that we may have in the class we might notice them not participating as much, um, 
and unable to make decisions when we ask them about things, you know, can well, tell me when you're able to do that or when you can get that to me and they can't make a decision. Um, and also the increase of use of alcohol or other drugs. It might be something we notice when they turn up for class. Physical, how students are feeling, um, it can affect their physical well-being, you know, like these pounding heart, chest pains, rapid heartbeat, uh, shortness in breath. And these are the other things we brought up before, which they think is a physical or something that's wrong with them medically. Diarrhea, stomach pain, the sleeping comes up again, um, headache, muscle aches, pains, and this real difficulty in concentrating. So I'm sure you've noticed a lot of these before and some of the students you might be concerned about. There are also different types of anxiety disorders. Um, so as we've said, and Paula mentioned earlier, they don't just happen once or try, twice, an anxiety disorder. They're ongoing over a prolonged period of time and they interfere with a person's work, study or other relationships. So some of these other anxiety disorders, look at the first one, generalised anxiety disorder. This can be explained by, you know, this, the overwhelming unfounded anxiety and worry about things that may go wrong, you know, accompanied by multiple physical and psychological symptoms for at least six months. So they can worry excessively about money, health, family and work, even when there are no signs of trouble. You know, these are things that might happen. And this anxiety is really difficult to control. Another disorder is so social phobia. Um, where students may have extreme discomfort or fear in a variety of social situations, um, speaking, you know, and we put our students through, you know, where they have to get up and do an oral presentation. And this could be really difficult for students having this sort of disorder. Even for some, it's eating in public or, or social events um, can have a key, key fear um, in, in what others are thinking badly of them in those situations. OCD, um, very disabling, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder and students um, it's, it, um, find it very hard to progress out of this and, you know, unable to actually control it on their own and will need help. Um, so they might, and this might look like um, in how they're acting, but it also could be how they're thinking, have these obsessive thoughts and compulsive behaviours which accompany feelings of anxiety. A PTSD can occur after a person is exposed to an actual or even a threatened um, death or serious injury or sexual violation or trauma. It could be from a home invasion um, as well, war, torture, depending on where our students are coming from or any sort of accident that's happened in the past. Panic disorder. Short periods of extreme anxiety, which we can be called and referred to as a panic attack. And this is a sudden onset of intense apprehension, fear or terror. It can begin suddenly and then develop rapidly. Symptoms are very similar to a heart attack. Panic is terrifying um, and the fear can be likened to terrifying threats from somewhere you can't quite see. So although the fear is real, the threats are not. And then there are other specific phobias. These are persistent um, and excessive or unreasonable fear specific um, phobias could be related to place, events or objects. Um, things like spiders, insects, mice, snakes and heights, blood, injections, driving, flying, any of those. Um, and so they, they, students will try to avoid or people will try and avoid those things. These are very common, but perhaps less disabling than other anxiety disorders. So... We have found um, that the Mental Health First Aid Action Plan, uh, and this comes from the Mental Health First Aid Manual, um, that some of you may have done the course, but we find it a really useful as a reference. Um, and this provides an action plan on how to help someone in a mental health crisis or who is developing one. So the acronym is ALGI, 
And these actions may not necessarily appear in this order or, or need to be followed in this order. They're just numbered to help remember. So I'm just going to briefly go through them. Um, so one thing that does run through all of these and is very important is listening, you know, to listen non-judgmentally and it needs to occur throughout all stages of the action plan. So if we look at A, approach, assess and assist with any crisis, this is when you approach the person about your concerns about their anxiety. So, so you know, spend time talking with the person about their experiences and let them know that you're there to listen without being judgmental. So you might need to find a suitable time and place where you both feel comfortable. And if the person doesn't initiate the conversation about how they're feeling, perhaps, you know, you can work out how you could say something to, to help them talk. Important to respect the person's privacy and confidentiality. The L, listen and communicate non-judgmentally. This during this one, engage the person in how they're feeling and be really important to listen carefully to what they're saying. Spend time talking with the person about their experience and let them know that you're there to listen without being judgmental. Do not express any negative judgments about their character or the situation and be aware of your body language, you know, what you're, you're, you're showing in when, you're, when you're listening. Important to reflect back what you hear and ask clarifying questions. You know, you know you've told me this, is this what you've said? You know, what I'm hearing is this, is this what you've said? Um, and allow silences. Don't be worried about silences. Be really aware of giving flippant advice, like, you know, oh, come on, you've got to pull yourself together. It's not going to be very helpful at all. The G, give support and information. So treat the person with respect and dignity. Don't blame them for their illness. Have reasonable expect expectations for them and offer consistent emotional support. Give them hope for recovery. You know, that will, there, there are ways around this. There are ways that you can, you know, that will help you feel better. Maybe you can make a, a suggest a suggestion, you know, of a person to see a doctor or a health professional um, and um, provide practical help. So offer information so they and help them perhaps find the information that they need. The E, encourage appropriate professional help. Ask them if they need help to manage how they're feeling. You know, start off asking them. And if they, you know, don't give you an answer for that, discuss perhaps appropriate professional help and effective treatment options that they may have for seeking help. So encourage, encourage them to use these options. Offer to help them seek out these options and encourage the person not to give up seeking professional help. And this may even mean, you know, you, you would help make the appointment for them and take them to that appointment. And so I encourage the person to face their fears with support from their doctor or psychologist. And the last E, encourage other supports. So encourage them to consider other support like family, friends and support groups they might have. And encourage the person to try and get enough sleep, exercise and eat healthy food if that seems to be, you know, you can notice that by their physical outlook. If you know any of their friends or family members, encourage them and invite the person out and to, to invite the person out and keep in touch. But don't put any pressure on them to participate in those activities. So as Sandra mentioned, it's important to listen and communicate non-judgmentally. Often we have conversations with our teachers where we talk about, you know, what, what should we say or how can we respond? What are the right words to use? You know, it's important to remember that we're not there to provide solutions. Rather, we can listen and we can give accurate information if the person wants it. It can be difficult in the moment to know what to say. Um, so here are some sentence starters and expressions that can be used to help start the conversation, or help guide a conversation that you're having with a student in distress. Um, it's important to remember to be open and welcoming. Tell them that you're there to support. Always give people choice and hope for recovery. We need to be honest and transparent in our conversations with students at these times. 
and it's so we can ask the student is it okay for me to share this information or you're telling me this I need you I need to help you access help or what I really need to do is get you support or get that get you the help that you need we need to be direct so it's okay to say I can see that you're really upset it's okay to say I'm worried and concerned about you we need to remain calm and not react as well as validate their experience acknowledge that their anxiety must be difficult to handle and don't dismiss fears or tell the students that their anxiety is unfounded even if we don't think it's much it's very real to them and if you're worried about their safety it's okay to ask are you thinking of hurting yourself or to tell them right now you're not safe i need to talk to counseling support you've told me you're not safe so if students do disclose thoughts of self-harm what do we do we're not counselors and one of the most common things that teachers may be worried about when dealing with students and their mental health is when a student might disclose thoughts of self-harm and that's when we do need to act as teachers we have a duty of care to our students so again often we talk about what we need to do if this situation occurs so if this occurs you know again the listening and communicating non-judgmentally let students know that you're concerned about them let students know that your safety that their safety is your priority and that you have a responsibility to keep them safe and let them know that you'll need to contact professionals who can assist them now this information then needs to be escalated and communicated to your supervisor your manager and counselling services as they are best placed to provide the students with the assistance that they need at that time for example um, in our center if this occurs our first action is to contact counselling and they come over and speak to the student sorry I'm trying to get there we go um, your center might have a process for helping teachers assess assist students in distress this is one of our most recent flow charts from counseling services at the university of adelaide all of our teachers have these at their workstations and um, in their class folders so they're easily accessible uh, you can find an earlier version of this in the appendix of the ea guide to best practice in international student mental health 2018 this is a more updated one this flow chart really helps teachers to um, identify high level distress and low level distress and what can be said to students in each instance as well as who to contact and what to do after the event so it's a nice summary and easy resource to access at all times so it's essential to follow process after the event as well both for record keeping but also for your own self-care um, regardless of what's discussed or disclosed it can be quite traumatic um, and disturbing for the listener so it's essential to debrief and follow up either with your supervisor or with an employee assistance program if needed and practice self-care so also think about what you need so what can we do about all this before it happens how can we help students develop strategies to recognize their feelings and get on top of them before it snowballs as we mentioned earlier in 2018 english australia put out a guide to the best practice in international student mental health and a key statement that stood out for us from the guide was the easiest mental health problem to address is the one that doesn't take place so paula and i got together and started to think about what we could do in our center and our classrooms to support students and how we could promote proactive preventative measures and encourage social engagement and community building to foster a sense of belonging research has shown that students believe their sense of community and belonging at university not only has a positive effect on their academic achievements and general satisfaction there's also evidence that it improves their mental health and general well-being 
So we wanted to not only create this type of environment, if we could, but also provide students and teachers with a space to talk about mental health and wellbeing and to break down any stigmas, which may vary in different cultures, as well as provide them with wellbeing literacy. So, you know, the meta language needed to discuss and participate in, in their community. So in the next part of our webinar, um, we're going to share with you some tools and strategies that students and teachers can use either to address potential issues before they become overwhelming or in dealing with anxiety as it occurs. So one strategy is an awareness raising campaign and this is what we started with. Um, and this just includes posters all around our centre and classrooms, office doors, and as you can see, some of them there, safe space posters, which we'd like to point out, this came from um, the Rainbow Hub, uh, Louise Kane and Tegan McCarthy, who presented in 2017 at EA, and they were, um, 2018, should I say, and they um, were happy to share their resource, and we love that, that sign that we've got around. Um, the diverse, inclusive, accepting, welcoming, safe space for everyone. Um, we've got Are You OK posters, mindfulness posters, the stop poster all around for people and for staff included, and the happiness calendar. So we've got that in every classroom and most staff doors, and you can see even in bathrooms. So it's a really visual effect. So we've implemented this, and there's been a lot of, lot of positive feedback from this very simple step and this high visibility of these resources and messages. Um, another strategy is embedding mindfulness activities in the classroom. So what's mindfulness? Um, I know that I try to practice it a lot, but often I don't have the time. <laughs> and mindfulness is being fully present. It's being aware of where we are and what we're doing. And it may help students not be overly reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around them especially at one of those pressure points in the program, assessment time, et cetera. We found this resource from the International Association for University Health and Wellbeing, uh, which was funded by the Department of Education and Training, Higher Education Participation and Partnerships Program to be particularly useful. The resources developed in this program, in this project, contribute to the development of health wellbeing and coping strategies for students. And they also correlate to key milestones during the student's time at the university. So the topics focus on areas such as myself, my study, my success, which helps students adapt their study styles to their personality, for example. There's also another one called Change, Thrive and Achieve, module five, which helps students look at feedback positively for academic success. So each module includes a lecture, a workshop, student workbook, teacher manuals and downloadable MP3s. Um, all of these resources can be used to focus on those key points I showed you earlier. They can also be expanded or followed with daily, weekly, short mindfulness sessions in the classroom. Teachers have also used them for listening activities, speaking activities, etc. And here are some other useful resources and apps that can be introduced to students and used either in the classroom or students can be encouraged to use them independently to encourage wellbeing through mindfulness. Some ways that these can be used in a class um, are at the start of a class, to focus the class, at the end of a class, before handing out feedback from an assignment, for example. I'm sure you can think of many other ways to use them in your classroom. So another strategy um, that we've implemented in our centre is a gratitude wall. This has been implemented in all classrooms in a, across our centre and it's an activity that doesn't take a lot of time either to prepare or in the actual classroom but it has a great deal of impact and it's a complementary goal rather than a competing goal for our students academic skills development. Why the focus on gratitude? In positive psychology research, gratitude is strongly and consistently associated with greater happiness. It also helps people feel more positive emotions, appreciate good experiences, improve their health, deal with adversity and build strong relationships. 
So this activity, we hope, helps to give students the tools and strategies to develop this sense of gratitude. Um, also giving them perspective, especially when related to that balance of work, life and study. Helps them have empathy for themselves and for others. And also helps them get ideas from others because sometimes when we've had a hard day, it's hard to find and think about what we're actually grateful for. For teachers, it's an insight or it can be an insight into the student's mind. Um, if they're struggling to find gratitude, then what can this tell us? So this is an example gratitude wall. This particular one was displayed in a classroom for one of our five week programs and students continue to add to it every week. Some teachers have done a similar thing using different resources. Um, for example, Padlet or Neopod. Um, another class had an actual physical class journal that students could add to every day, every week. And here are some of the things that students were grateful for. Um, this student was grateful for being themselves and for doing things that they liked. Another student was grateful that they went to sleep early last night. So they don't have to be big things. It's really about finding gratitude for the little things, which can have such a big impact in positive emotions. Another strategy is our random act of kindness uh, wall, I suppose. Um, and we've just found, you know, just how students can light up um, if someone's kind to them unexpectedly just by saying hello or acknowledging them because students often feel, well, we've heard from international students that they feel invisible. And if a teacher walking by or in a lift actually turns to them and says, hello, how's your day? And they think, you know, oh, they've spoken to me. I'm actually visible. Someone's seen me. So why do we choose kindness? Um, so there are many studies that back that up and have shown kindness promotes empathy and compassion and leads to this sense of interconnectedness with others. So compassion and kindness also can reduce stress and help reduce the negative emotions such as anxiety and anger and depression. So acts of kindness fit in with our overall goals in bringing in the community and making students feel part of the community. And it's well known um, that it can improve mood and encourage people to pay it forward. So this sort of means that one good deed can create a domino effect and improve the day of dozens of people. Um, so here's an example of um, our the, the act of kindness wall, which was in a classroom, and um, the class had this poster which they could add to um, once a week, more times a week. It depended on when, whenever the class or the teacher wanted to put up something or to get them to work on it. And here are some examples. Um, we've got a closer one too that you can see. You know, um, thank my friend for being a friend and buying lunch. And this one, take time to really listen to a parent um, talking with friends on the phone. And there's been other ones too of here. Buy a meal to the homeless man who is sitting in front of my home's building. Um, so, and this is across all levels. It doesn't have to be a higher level class, lower level class, it works with all. And it depended on how, you know, the teacher would introduce it and how they would back it up and bring it in and set the context. So this is happening in every classroom. And even though um, the students don't always have the same room for their class, it's up there and any class can add to the wall. And again, as Paul said, with gratitude, just reading what other people are doing gives students ideas. We did follow this up with um, their reflections on it, which we presented in part of our presentation, the EA conference. But for the for this this webinar, we're not going to include that. But it was really um, exciting and encouraging to see what students said they got out of it. Something else that can be done um, with things that you perhaps you're already doing is adapting classroom activities. Um, so pyramid discussion on resilience. So you know probably all used pyramid discussions before, um, but this time we can focus on things like resilience and getting the students together in a group to make a list of 20 things um, of how they can respond to and recover from failure. So they make this list, then mix up the groups and they then pick 10, or no, sorry, individually they can pick 10 or you can do that in a, in a smaller group and then pair up and try and agree on five and so on. 
warmer discussions, three good things right now in your life, um, three, you know, maybe this week, notice three good things every day and identify five things you've in common with your partner. And we found this to be really good because often when they're feeling quite different and um, like they're on this losing streak and everyone else is doing a lot better, it's great to find something in common. Find someone who, you all know that activity, but change it to things like, a, you know, who's got a beautiful smile, wearing a cool jacket, um, encourage um, um, people to feel good about themselves, you know, who is friendly to everybody so they will can increase their self-confidence. Origami chatterbox, if you're good at folding coloured bits of paper, and then you can have um, positive statements on them, you know, like, you know, they pull out their numbers, okay, today you've got to be kind, today you've got to make someone smile. And the ball circle game, you know, where you're tossing a bag around, usually this is done in the beginning of programs to learn names, um, but you can introduce the grateful wall and the, the kindness wall um, by using this student, uh, the circle game. There's many, many more, and we did those that did attend our session. We had, I think, 29 plus or whatever. Um, so I'm sure you know you just use your creativity and adapt classroom activities you're already using. So this is one of the resources that we've found and loved, um, and we have all around our centre in staff rooms and in each classroom. And individual teachers use it in many different ways, from warmers to quick conversation starters um, and it's free to download it comes out every month um, from the website and and we thought we could finish the presentation today by looking at today October the 15th and there's plenty of today left for most of you and it's so you can um, today's is to do something to overcome an obstacle you are facing so we're going to leave you with that and also ask, um, because that comes to the end of our presentation, and um, I'm sure Sophie will take questions if there are any. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, you can type them into the, the chat box. We'll just wait a second for them to come through. Might always also go forward to the resources while we're waiting as well. Yep. So someone's asked me if the slides will be available. So um, a link to the recording <coughs> and to the slides will be emailed to everybody tomorrow. Okay, someone has a question. They've said, have you been using the healthyuniversities.org with the regular teaching load? Yes, I mean, that we, we encourage um, teachers that they can embed that within their yep. teaching load. It will take a small time because there, there's a, a teaching, it's a manual, there's activities. They don't have to follow it step by step. It's just uh, encouraging people to take what they want out of it. It's not a formalised part of our curriculum, but it's just a resource um, that we thought was really fabulous and it's mm. free. Um, so, you know, getting, as, as Paula said, it's not about competing with the, the skills curriculum, it's complementing our academic curriculum. Yeah, and even though that healthyuniversities.org, the resources are fairly lengthy. So if you were to do, I think they have two hour workshops or one hour workshops, there's a lot of um, activities that can be pulled out and done in much shorter time. So um, it's a good resource for teachers to take apart and use as fits with their program. If they need some extra listening practice, they can download one of the lectures. Um, yeah. Okay. Someone has asked if you've found a difference in the levels of anxiety with students at your centre since using these techniques. 
anecdotally, um, because we we just sort of starting to embed this. This has been, you know, we presented at EA in September, and we've just got the the wall in each classroom. And next year, what we're hoping to do is to um, formalise it and add it to a, you know make it a compulsory part of the curriculum, about four or five lessons. Um, we can only go by the the feedback we got from students, and we ask them to reflect. Um, so we haven't done any major study to see now how many people are coming, making appointments, you know, um, and are presenting. So no, we can't say that. But certainly the reflections of students and how they were going to wanted to take it into their life, you know, if they finish their course, they're going to continue to do this. Um, things like that were really, really encouraging. And how it made them feel was one of the most the things that stood out. Of when they did and like perhaps a, a, an act of kindness it wasn't just about the person they did it to but how seeing how that person was happy made them feel really good so there was a lot of there were a lot of happiness you know in their reflection the word happiness came up it would be really interesting to look at how many times that came up yeah okay great and someone's just commented that they can see how these activities could be used not just in class but also at lunchtime and after class or part of the social calendar Absolutely, yeah. especially as part of a social club. If your centre has one, it can be the basis of some of those interesting activities. And having those, like the calendar around the centre, you know, on different on staff room doors and, and in places that, you know, I've got one on my, one of the pictures actually was my door where students are often waiting in between classes. It's just visible when they see and they can use it at any time. And it's good for staff as well. I often read what day it is and what I have to do for that day. It makes me feel good. <laughs> Someone has asked, is there anything you can add or anything specific with students suffering with anxiety and grief from the loss of a family member? Well, I think if you go back to the mental health, um, I can't go back on the slides, but the, um, the mental health action plan and looking at the acronym there, um, if, oh, okay. Right. That that whole thing with with listening um, and acknowledging and not being judgmental. Um, if I think at, at any point, if it becomes something that someone, a staff member, feels they can't handle themselves, it's then referring on. Like if you look at the E, if the first E, encourage appropriate professional help. Going to make an appointment with counselling, going and talking to somebody who, um, and that's what we would do, um, and giving them the information, pointing them out, you know, doing a web search of where they can go or who they can call to get some um, counselling or just talk to someone um, beyond blue, those sorts of, we have all of those lines available. There's also, we have a 24 hour. We have an after hours number for students with counselling service that they can either call or text. Um, so nothing more than specific as we just follow this, this mental health action plan. And um, those things, listen, communicate, give support, encourage, and that pointing out where they can go to get help, I would say is one of the, the best things. Because often as teachers, we're the first port of call, we're with our students a lot. And so students might come to us in the first instance. Um, but we're not always um, best placed to provide them with the assistance that they need. And that's where it's important to follow that action plan and encourage appropriate professional help if needed. Listening to, not starting to go into your own life. Oh, look, when my grandmother died or when this happened to me, you know, and then it took, I got over it. You know, it's more about acknowledging what they're feeling, what they're thinking um, and listening. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, somebody has asked if we should be wary of any negative or unintended consequences um, of starting the mental health conversation. Uh, starting it or if a student, because often we find it's a yeah. student that will come to mm. us. Um, no, I think if, if anyone's concerned, um, I think it's always important to have the conversation. If you don't you know, go in direct, you know, too deeply straight away. But look, I'm just, I've noticed you've been late a lot lately. Um, 
-hmm. is there any reason just sort of digging a little bit to find if it's more because you could find oh my alarm clock's not working something like that but if it's more serious and what I have found is that students will be pretty honest if they're feeling down um, or if they're suffering even though they might not seek help by going to a counsellor when they're talking to their teacher um, they will be pretty honest if asked you know the, the question about you know, I, I am concerned and um, you have been late a lot lately do you want you know is there any reason and so they, they, they'll, pretty, they'll give you the answer I think, that they're feeling the same when Paula talked about um, self-harm um, students you know it can be quite surprising at how honest students will be um, if they have been thinking of that and they'll come straight out and say well yes or they'll say no no I'd never hurt myself um, and that's a real you know we've, we've all been told you know, that does come out that's when we really need to get somebody who can help us through that mm -hmm. and again listening and as we, we've got counsellors who will come over straight away if that's how a student presents. Yeah, sure. Um, somebody's asked how teachers have accepted um, all of these resources and initiatives. Um, really well, because I think, um, you know, this has been a conversation that we've been having for a while now and how to best support our students and support their well-being. So it's something that as a centre and I guess everyone is very committed towards. Um, we did start the trial of the Gratitude Wall and the Acts of Kindness with a small group of teachers um, just so that we could, um, you know, control the feedback and, and get some ideas from them. Um, we also helped by preparing a lot of the resources at the beginning and giving it to the teachers so that they didn't have to spend a lot of time doing that. Mm. What we found was other teachers then saw what was happening in that classroom or they spoke about it and they started doing it kind of um, organically, which was great. So um, we found um, teachers to be very positive and students as well. Great. All right, I think um, that's it for the questions and we probably do have to finish. I just wanted to also add that the English Australia Guide to Best Practice in International Student Mental Health that uh, Sandra and Paula referred to a few times is available. It's open access, free to download from the English Australia website. So if you go to www.englishaustralia.com.au and then go to professional development, you'll see the best practice guides link and you'll be able to download the full guide as a PDF. Um, and it's, it's full of very practical examples from Ellicott centres all over Australia of how people are supporting students with their mental health. All right, well, thank you so much um, everybody for coming. And again, thank you, Sandra and Paula, it was, a really clear and practical um, session with lots of information and advice about an issue which is really on everyone's minds at the moment. And I really loved that there were so many activities that people can take away and use in their centres and in the classroom as well. So thank you very much on behalf of English Australia. There are lots and lots of thank yous and great sessions coming through on the chat as well. So I'll be able to forward those comments to you, um, the presenters, tomorrow. Thank, thank you, Sophie, thank and thank you everyone, you everyone for coming along. Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Sophie. Bye. Bye.